Today, we're joined by photographer and filmmaker Marcus Russell Price and former editor-in-chief of Life Magazine, editor and writer Bill Shapiro in conversation about gaining access, building trust, and creating lifelong connections with photography subjects. To give you a bit of background on today's guest, Marcus Russell Price travels as a touring photographer and filmmaker with comedians and actors such as Aziz Ansari, Judd Apatow, Pete Davidson, John Mulaney, and Amy Schumer. Beyond that, Price was executive producer and DP of Schumer's three-part HBO documentary, Expecting Amy. His images have been seen on billboards, Comedy Central, Netflix, Hulu, comedy album covers, magazine covers, and as a frontline photographer for the Black Lives Matter movement. Most recently, Price photographed the late June cover for New York Magazine and directed an upcoming comedy special for the Peacock Network to be released later this year. We are also joined today by Bill Shapiro, a contributing editor to Like a Conversations, the former editor-in-chief of Life Magazine, as well as the founding editor-in-chief of Life.com, which won the 2011 National Magazine Award for Digital Photography. Bill is the author of several books, among them, Gus and Me, the best-selling children's book he co-wrote with Rolling Stones guitarist Keith Richards. In 2018, he published What We Keep. He's written about photography for the New York Times Magazine, Vanity Fair, The Atlantic, Vogue, Esquire, The Los Angeles Times, among others. And with that, I'll hand it over to Bill to start the conversation. Thank you, everyone. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the program. Thank you so much, Ash. Um, hello, everyone, and hello, Marcus. Um, welcome to this Like a Conversation at Photoville. I am so glad to be here, and I'm so glad everybody's here from around the country and around the world. Um, when I first met Marcus a few years ago in New York City, I had no idea that he was the photographer to the comedy world. Uh, a mutual friend of ours had wanted to introduce us, and so the three of us met up at a gallery in New York City um, where there was a Robert Frank exhibit. Marcus rolls up with a camera draped around his neck, and I got to be honest, I thought, like, okay, kind of a bold move to go to a Robert Frank show with a camera around your neck, but okay, I get it. Um, but the thing that I didn't understand then that I understand now is what makes Marcus tick is taking, and, and, and the thing that really I think he loves more, almost as much as anything else, is taking photos of his friends, candid, informal shots that capture those ephemeral and fleeting moments of our lives. And I guess that that day qualified. As I dug deeper into Marcus's photos, the thing that impressed me and really hooked me was their energetic intimacy and their looseness and a relatability deep in their DNA, which is not only hard to find in any situation, but it's so rare to see when you're shooting stars at the caliber and the level that Marcus shoots. So I am really looking forward to today's program. Um, for a few reasons. One is I really want to hear Marcus talk about his approach and his technique and his pictures. And I'm also looking forward to throwing Marcus wildly off balance with my um, probing, brutal questions, which I have here on these note cards. Um, I'm also looking forward to hearing from a few very, very funny surprise guests, which I think you'll enjoy. And that's coming a little bit later in the program. And finally, both Marcus and I really want to hear your comments and your questions about his technique and his pictures. And so I hope you'll use the chat and send those through and we'll, we'll get to those later on um, in the program. So Marcus, if you're ready, may we dive in with question number one. Hey, what's happening? How are you? Okay. Were you really judging me when we first met? <laughs> I, was, I was judging you afterwards. I was judging you not in real time, but afterwards. All right. Okay. Yeah. But you passed. Um, so... Yeah. Here's the first question. Comedians, it's a, this, is a, this is a super specialized niche, um, but I know you didn't start as a photographer, but rather as a graphic designer. So how did you go from graphic design to this hyper-specialized world of photographing comedians? Um, I kind of 
stumbled into it. I mean, I always loved comedy. And I, when I was working as a graphic designer, I'd spend a lot of my evenings working, but also listening to comedy. At one point, I, I came across uh, the work of Hannibal Burris, and I was like, oh my God, this guy's just brilliant. So I, I after a brief Facebook stalking, I realized that we had a mutual friend, and I, I begged that friend to introduce us. And so we linked up. I shot some photos of him in San Diego. He happened to really like them. I was like, hey, man, I dig your comedy. Um, I, you know, I'd love if you ever need help with anything, if you ever need more work, more photos, just please let me know. And so I started working with Hannibal pretty regularly. And then through Hannibal, um, I was able to meet Aziz and then Amy and Pete Davidson and Chris Rock. And they, it, just, it just really snowballed at that point. Um, comedy is a very close-knit community in that way. If you spend any amount of time in it, sooner or later, you'll pretty much run into all your favorites. So it sounds like you're sort of a, a commercial for the benefits of stalking. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. So if, if you need any tips, just let me know. I, I got great links to send you. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, I do have a question for you because, well, I have a lot of questions for you, but this question for you is, you know, comedians, I'm curious to know how are comedians different from the other types of artists that you've shot over the course of your career? And, you know, what are the unique challenges with shooting this group? Um, comedians are like the most observant humans on the planet, perhaps. I don't know. Maybe, maybe shy of, of scientists. I don't know. But first of all, I, I, I can't have, I can't be too sensitive because I get roasted damn near every day, every day. <laughs> and so I got to be able to roll with that. I'm not, I'm not funny in that way. So I can't really uh, give as good as I get it, but I, I get it pretty good. Um, but outside of that, um, yeah, I, like, I, I once, I can't remember who, but I once heard someone describe comics or, or liken them to like a thoroughbred racehorse. And that's like, that they were almost created for this very specific purpose that they were, they were bred to be like the funniest people on the planet. And um, as a result, like I said, they understand, they're, they're so observant and they understand the human condition better than Dan or anyone. And they're able to analyze a situation, maybe something that would be mundane or maybe something that would be even heartbreaking in some cases and they're able to see and find the humor in it and flip it in a way that that I would never be able to that you would never be able to particularly that you would never be able to Bill but <laughs> but uh as a result like, like that's why I love comedy so much is that it's it's it they're able to to talk about things that that we all feel and like just just the unspoken parts of life um and make it relatable and make it funny um, they're, they're modern day philosophers, I'd say. But in terms of that observational quality that you just mentioned, that they're, the, that they're among the most observant people on the planet, um, you know, photographers are too. So, so what is it like to photograph somebody who is perhaps as observant as you are? You know, are they, uh, are they? You gotta play it cool, baby. You gotta, you gotta keep it cool. All right. <laughs> You know, I mean, I mean, what is the exact title of this? Is 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 access and and trust, trust and trade offs? Yeah, like it's I, it's it wasn't something that was easily earned, you know. But I, I think for whatever reason, I, I've become someone that these people trust, and and maintaining that trust is really, really important. Well, we'll um, we'll I want to get deeper into that in a second, but I uh, I do want to, I do want to jump ahead a little bit because. You know, Marcus goes on tour, uh, as Ash mentioned earlier, with um, with comedians, often spending you know weeks and weeks on the road with them. And and I'm going to ask you um, about that work in a few minutes. But but right now, you know, I was also really curious about what it's like to work with you, um, what it's like to be one of those observant comedians on the other end of the on the other end of the lens, and and how they see you. And so. To find out, I asked Marcus to ask some of his celebrity subjects for their unfiltered insights into what it's like to work with uh, Marcus Russell Price. So let's start by hearing from star Saturday Night Live alum uh, and stand-up comedian extraordinaire, John Mulaney. Marcus Russell Price. You go by Marcus, I always call you Marcus Russell Price. Yeah. Marcus Price, Marcus R. Price, Marcus Russell Price is the Gordon Parks of his generation and the Forrest Gump of the 
touring comedy world. He's he's been at every important event in in both live music and live comedy. Um, most especially this dental conference that I just performed at, that he just shot at, uh, to commemorate when I did OK for 50 minutes in front of dentists. Marcus has a wonderful eye. Marcus, uh, beyond that, you know, beyond that, I'll talk right to him because he's filming this. You also have, you have a wonderful eye and a very adventurous spirit. So he will, you can find him like that guy in Ocean's Eleven that can fold into a drawer. You'll see him. He'll be under someone's, he'll be between people's legs and he's getting angles you can't even imagine. Um, it's very invasive to people. But he's the greatest. You're great, Marcus. You're, you're, you're a real artist and an original. And, uh, and I did okay in front of these bandits. Well, thank you, John Mullaney. Fantastic. Um, <laughs> so, so, Marcus, um, dental conferences aside, just for the moment, um, you've told me that shooting during performances isn't actually your favorite part of the job. Why is that? Um, it's not that it's not my favorite. I, I don't want it to sound like I, I dislike it because I love it. I love live comedy. It, it's one of my favorite things in the world, but maybe it's, it's doesn't feel like the most important part. Um, you know, if I'm traveling with John or with Hannibal or Aziz or whoever, you know, I, I, I get more or less like the same dozen photos every night, depending on the venue that you're in, um, which are important. But, uh, I, I say that the, the most memorable parts are the things that happen offstage, the things that happen in the uber or in the bus or on the plane or on the way to the venue or in the hotel you know that these are the parts that stand out the most to me um and those are the ones that i got i really like um i kind of always got my, my my peepers on trying to find like the right moment so when you are shooting the performances how, how do you how do you keep it fresh how do i keep it fresh uh good question how do i keep it fresh thank you I, 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 I got to keep moving, first of all, because it's easy to sit down and, and just like, oh, I, I've got that picture tomorrow. I already got that last night. You know, I got to just stay moving and just be ready for anything to happen. Because a lot of times, like, things, these guys, like I said, they're, they're, they're super observant and so creative. And they're, they're some of the strongest minds I've ever encountered. So, like, something can happen in a, in a moment's notice, and I kind of have to be prepared for that, whether they interact with the audience member or they try something new on stage or the other night John decided to sit down on the stage which I never saw him do before so I had to run from the back of the room all the way to the front of the room and like I was able to get that moment um I gotta keep it moving well I want to ask you about um the picture that we have up on screen of the great Dave um Chappelle mm. what were you I, I love this picture what were you trying to capture here and and what do you think makes this such a strong image um, Dave Chappelle stops time. I don't know how he does it, but he has his button on, he's a, he can stop time. I've, I've seen him sit on a stage legit for four hours and hold a captive audience for four hours. Um, it's incredible. And, and, and that's, once again, that's how strong his mind is, is he'll just sit and he'll just talk at the audience. Not even necessarily, I mean, obviously, you know, he, he's building material, but sometimes I'm, I imagine that he doesn't even know what he's going to be talking about. And he can sit on stage and, and just, just in, converse with the audience. And then suddenly something he says gets a big laugh and his mind is able to bookmark that. And then maybe the next night he's able to pull on that a bit more and, and stretch on it. And that's what I love about comedy is that people always ask me, like, do you get sick of hearing the same jokes over and over? Like, I never get sick of it because I love watching how a joke evolves and changes. Um, and, and with, with Dave, he can just hold a room captive for hours and it's, it's, it's magic. There, there's no one. And, and so do, do, do you feel that this picture captures that sensibility, this, this well, ability? Well, yeah, look at him. He's on. smoking on stage, first of all. Like, right. I was going to ask that. about that. But Dave Chappelle, um, and just like, he's, he's, like, I think he's looking at his cigarette even. And that's, that's just him, I think, caught in the moment himself. He's just pondering, thinking about what he's going to say next. and. And no one is, is like, get on with it. Everyone is just waiting for whatever the next word is to come out of his mouth. And, and being in, the, in a room with him as many times as I've, I have, I, I, I know that feeling so well of just kind of almost being on the edge of your seat. What, what's he going to say next? Like, what brilliance is he going to spew out? Well, I also love the fact that the audience has sort of 
faded to black here. I think it's mm-hmm. uh, I think that really, you know, makes makes Chappelle and that position that he's in and the smoke really come forward to us. So so I love that. So so you um, a moment ago you said you know rather than the the moments on the stage you know you love the Uber um, you know the um, hanging out in a liquor store or or whatnot but you know as you know and anybody in this business knows um, today celebrity photo shoots are so tightly managed by PR folks. Um, who often allocate, you know, all of 15 or 20 minutes for a shoot. And in that time, it is like impossible to get something spontaneous and authentic. But you, Marcus Russell Price, you sort of have the keys to this closed world. So given the time and access that you have, what kind of moments are you looking for and why choose those moments? You know, why, why, why those moments? Um, I think, like, as we discussed, like, the moments offstage, just, like, the kind of the quiet, intimate moments are, happen to be my most favorite, you know, because to me, these guys, they're, they're, they're legends. They're, they're living rock stars in their own way. And I love that I, they trust me enough and that I, I have that access and they give me the opportunity to, like, not just be, like, their hired photographer, but, like, I, I call all these people, my friends at this point, because we spend so much time together and then we are so, our lives are so intertwined at this point, you know? And when I'm working with Amy and Hannibal and Aziz and John and Nick Kroll, like all these people, um, they're they're icons and and they are now, but they sure as hell are gonna be icons 10, 20 years from now. And you see these older photos of guys like Richard Pryor. And and for me personally, I see these photos and thank God, thank God, someone was there to take that picture, you know? Um, and and in, in many cases, that person is now me. And even if it weren't me, I'd want it to be someone because I, I, these images feel so important to me. And as I say, I think comedy is is one of the greatest things that humans have ever created. Like just the, the ability to laugh is, is so, so important. So being able to capture these people just as they move through, through life um, is a real privilege and pleasure for me. So, uh... I want to get specific about um, some of the photos that we just saw a minute ago, um, or photos like them. Um, what makes one of these just hanging out moments a success in your eyes? And I'm talking about maybe from like a possibly from a formal perspective. So if you're on tour with somebody for you know a couple of weeks, you you've shot you know a thousand photos or whatever. When you're looking through those photos, what what makes you go like, oh yeah, that one right there, that's the keeper. What sort of elements does it have that sing to you? you you're, you're speaking like in terms of composition or just like like what moments am I attracted? I guess I'm, I guess I'm speaking about um, what, let's start with composition um, or, or other elements within it. You know, is it eye contact? Is it color? Is it light? Like what, what are the sort of things that make a picture sing to you? Um, well, I mean, these are the... you said in in your introduction like so much like so much of our of these moments are are very ephemeral and and fleeting and i mean what is a photograph if not like a a visual representation of a memory you know and and for me like i have photo albums that my parents were were kind enough to, to to put together you know and and sometimes you don't necessarily recognize the significance of a moment and so you're able to look at a photograph of it later, you know, right. and, and for me, like, those are the, I, I, if I can see into the future, if I had that ability, like, I, I, I see these, these photos I snap as, as sort of, like, being able to capture those moments that are, I don't know, the, the, that they feel important to me, and I, and I, I, I want to, like I said, my parents gave me that gift of, of having lots of photos, and I'd like to be able to pass that along to them. That's great. Um, what are you trying to reveal about these performers through your photos? Um, I mean, I love to reveal what happens behind the scenes because I don't think necessarily that they, 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 I don't know, like I love to reveal the, the process because like with these comics, I find them so brilliant and so like such remarkable humans. I think that people deserve to see how much work 
really goes into it a lot of times. I mean, not granted, not all of my photos are of the work, you know, but it's, but I, I love being able to capture a moment like 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 I, yeah. Can I talk about this photo of Amy here? Yeah, please. Like this, like we were in in Utah and we were on the way to the show, and we at this point we were midway through the tour. We've been on the road for weeks, but here she is like peeling through her set and and recreating it and rearranging it. It's um. She, she never stops working, you know what I mean? And I think that like, certainly these people are, are hilarious, but um, it, it's not by accident. They, they work incredibly, incredibly hard. And I think that obviously we, we, we reap the benefit of that, but I also, I, I love that people are able to see that and know that. Yeah, the process, you know, seems so important because usually we just see them on the stage and you know one of the things i love about your your photos and especially you know like this one of amy and a couple of the ones that we just saw um there are so many lighthearted photos that that you take but you also capture these sort of quietly intense um quietly you know intimate moments of deep concentration and um i, I don't know i just sort of i i i love I love that you do that too. Um, but let me ask you this, when you're taking a photo as you do, uh, you know, in an Uber or, or at a liquor store, you know, on the fly, what do you, what do you give up? What's sort of the trade-off there? Good question. Um, what do I give up? I, uh, <laughs> I'm, to an extent, I'm always working, if that's what you mean. <laughs> you know, I mean, I guess I meant more in terms of the um, the photography. Like, you know, when you're shooting on the fly, it's hard to get the perfect frame. Oh, sure. Is, is that important to you? What What's what's the sort of most important thing? Um, um, I mean, a, a photograph is not, I mean, with the access that I'm giving in as quickly as we're moving sometimes, like I'm not always able to, these, these aren't photo shoots. These aren't studio shoots. You know what I mean? And so I, I, I move quickly and obviously my instinct and my experience allows me to oftentimes to get photos that I'm very pleased with. But I think more importantly than finding the most perfect or most beautifully composed shot is just to be able to capture the moment itself. Um, um, some of my favorite photos that I've taken or that I've seen are just shot on, the, you know, like little point and shoot cameras that not much thought goes into it other than like, oh, this is a memory that someone wanted to or a moment that someone wanted to be able to remember. So, um, I, yeah, I, are we getting close to it? <laughs> to, to well, great. well, you know what? Um, when you look at this picture that's up that we have right up now of, of mm -hmm. Hannibal um, reaching back for some booze, and then the one before with um, Pete Davidson and MDK. his and, and, and Machine Gun Kelly, um, both of them have their arms sort of stretched back. Is that just a happenstance or is that something you look for to move our eye around the frame? Yeah, you know, it's funny, like, like I don't know, like, we, <laughs> I was about to make an, an analogy here and it sounds a little goofy, but I'm gonna go ahead and do it anyway. Like, you, you never see like, a, like lions in a huddle, like talking about what they're gonna do. You know what I mean? They kind of like, they move by instinct. And, and, and for me, like at this point, I don't necessarily, I'm not always thinking about like how to grab the shot. I just like, I just, I guess from repetition, I, I, I find myself in these positions that are, that make me happy with like the, the result. And with, with this one, like Pete and um, Colson, they were shooting a music video and they, we were in this restaurant. And I think I, that, uh, Colson MGK was giving direction to his his cinematographer and I just you know happened to be in the right place at the right time it's great I mean I feel like I'm at the table with them which I'm not sure I actually want to be but um but it looks great so um so you traveled in India with um Aziz Ansari the the amazing Parks and Rec actor and the Emmy award-winning creator of Master of None um so he seemed like the perfect person for us to ask about how you work. Let's um, let's see what the great um, Aziz had to say about working with you, Marcus. Uh, Marcus, Marcus wanted me to make a video about what it's like working with him or something. I'm on a very long drive and I'm bored, so I'm I'm, I'm doing it right now. Uh, Marcus. What I like about working with Marcus is, you know, he's 
in one sense he's kind of a fly on the wall like you don't know he's there when he's snapping shots but on on the other hand he's also like a delightful guy to be around so he's he's kind of like a very charming fly that's on the wall so sometimes he can be like a quiet fly and you don't know he's there and he's taking photos and using a bunch of different formats and things and cameras and and then other times he's this fly that's like really fun to be around only he's not a fly he's like a human being that's very funny and and uh you know, I, I, I think it goes a long way because, you know, a lot of the things that, that Marcus shoots, you know, performers on tour and things like that, you know, you're around people for a long time. And, and uh, you know, if, if they're not fun to be around, it's, uh, you know, it doesn't really matter how good the photos are. <laughs> you're not going to bring them on tour. Uh, but Marcus takes great photos and he's very fun to be with. And... Um, yeah, I, I really enjoy the time I've spent with him, and even when, we, when he texted me, uh, you know, I thought back to some, some great pre-COVID memories of being with Marcus in and, and India, and just all the photos we shot there together, and, and what a fun time we had as friends as well. Uh, so, uh, I hope I hope this serves your purposes, Marcus, um, and uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's Aziz, I'm sorry. Uh, okay. Hi. Fantastic. Um, I'm so glad that he kept his eyes on the wheel, never looking at the camera. He's a very responsible young man. <laughs> could, have been, could have been terrible. So, yeah, so you were you were in, in India with Aziz. Why don't we just flip through these pictures real quick? Yeah. I love that. It was so where, where, fun. Where, where was that one taken, that particular that was We were in an airport flying from um, Mumbai to Delhi. And this is an interesting photo because Aziz, or it, to me, first of all, I mean, I love the eye contact and just kind of being yeah. in this airport. Um, also, he's such a, a sharp dresser. But he, uh, he, he has his phone in his hand, which is, a, he probably wouldn't even like this photo, but because um, it's so rare that you would ever see him with a phone in his hand. He, he, he's the one we're on tour together. He's always encouraging people just to be present and to, to kind of be in the moment with what, with one another. But Aziz is a photographer himself. So when we were in India together, so much of the time was just he and I wandering the streets of India taking photos together. Um, you know, um, Marcus, um, a question came in that I want to ask you because you just touched on something. Um, how often does, and here's the question, how often does a comedian say to you, no, don't use that one? And then I guess the sort of, you know, corollary question is, um, how do you navigate that occurrence when they say, no, don't use that one? Um, I mean, of course, I, I always would respect their wishes. That, that, that goes into me being someone that they can trust. Um, so I, I generally always share my photos with the, with the comic. Um, but also at this point, like, I've, I've known these people for so long and worked with them for so long that I sort of know their, a lot of their tendencies and the type of images that they like and the ones that they don't like. But uh, above anything, maintaining trust is the most important part of all this. Okay. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, in fact, possibly right now, um, you know, you are an extremely humble person, but I'm going to ask you to set your humility aside just for a moment, would you? Um, because I really want to know what makes you the guy that all the comedians turn to? Uh, it's my uh, striking good looks. And yes, obviously. Sharp fashion sense. Uh, <laughs> I think a big part of my <laughs> skill set that makes me a successful uh, photographer for these guys is, is I guess, not, not being a weirdo. <laughs> Because, <laughs> like I said, comedians, they really are able to see and analyze everything so quickly. And, and like, like Aziz said in that video, like, it doesn't matter how good of a photographer you are. Like, you're not going to want to keep someone on the road with you if they're not easy to be around. You know, so it, it behooves me to be an easy presence. Like, and, and that's really a large part of my goal is, is I want someone to trust me and I want them to feel easy with me around and not like, oh, who's this guy with this camera? But like, rather like, oh, that, that's Marcus over there. So was was being an easy guy to be around? This is this sounds like a stupid question, but but I'm actually serious about it. Was that something that you had to learn to do, even around the edges, or is that just one of your you know God given gifts? Um, you gotta pay attention. You know, um, I, 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 I remember there's a quote that someone said that, that that like generally those people who feel anxious are the ones that aren't paying attention. 
And um, I think you got to just be able to, to, I don't know, understand the people that you're with. And if, if, you're, if you've ever been friends with anyone, then, then obviously you know how to observe and then see what type of mode someone's in. Um, there's, I, is it, sorry, did I answer the question or did we move on to another one? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we'll, we'll go into that a little bit more. I mean, you know, uh, in terms of earning their trust, yeah. um, you know, is it, is it something you do or something you don't do? I mean, like, obviously, you, you're not asking these guys for autographs. You're not running to the front of the line, the food line in the green room and taking all the good desserts. Um, <laughs> what, what's, is there something more subtle that you can sort of share with us about how you read the room? Um, well, yeah, I mean, it, it's, uh, th I mean, there's, I, I, like, one of the things I love about your Instagram, Bill, is all the photographers that you exhibit, um, and, and, and looking at it sometimes is really humbling to me, because I'm like, oh, some, like, I watched some of the photos you post, I'm like, oh, I'm shit, so, like, I'm not <laughs> the greatest photographer in the, in the world, you know what I mean, but, but what I do have is that, I mean, it, maybe part of it is right place at the right time. But uh, the reason I'm able to keep my job is that I don't, it, it's important to me that people feel comfortable around me. And that's my number one goal is I don't want to make people uncomfortable. Like, I, I could at any moment turn around and sell images of TMZ, but my, the people I work with know that I would never, I'd never do that. That's, it's the, I, longevity <laughs> is more important to me than like a quick sale, you know? Right. Um, but that's an interesting part of the calculus. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the longevity of your career and your, and your relationships versus, you know, a quote unquote killer, killer image. And we'll, you know, we'll, we'll circle back to that in a second. Um, you know, a lot of photographers, and I think this is part of the trust thing too. A lot of photographers are always saying, I keep my camera with me all the time because I never want to miss a shot. But you've told me in the past that sometimes you don't lift your camera and sometimes even you put your camera sort of intentionally across the room from where you're sitting or hanging out. Why do you do that and when? Um, it, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, I, it's, it's a thing that I see a lot in a lot of young photographers and granted, like you have to work hard in this business. And, and I don't, I don't, I wouldn't knock that instinct to like, and when I'm out, I, I always carry my camera, but it, in these moments of, of access, if we want to call it that, yes. if, if I'm at every moment jumping in someone's face or trying to take a picture, like, they, like it's, it, it ruins everything. Like it's, it's, if, if we're going to weigh the importance of a moment and a photograph, the moment is always gonna win. The, the memory itself is always the most important because it is a photographer, what is our job, but to capture life as life happens. And if I'm interrupting life by taking a photo, then I've already failed, you know? Um, so like the people like Pete, he's a very private person and, and he wouldn't have me around if he didn't know that I was, that keeping that or maintaining that privacy was just important to, to, to me as it was to him. Um, he's he's he he's constantly surrounded by paparazzi and like he had to leave his Manhattan apartment because every time he would come home, they would be staked out there waiting for him. And um, he gives so much of himself to his fans and, and that which he chooses to keep to himself. I, I really, uh, it's important to me to respect that. So in that situation, I'm going back to this, this instance of, of setting your camera, you know, on the counter across the room. Mm -hmm. Is that kind of like a signal to whoever you're with? that I'm not gonna be in your face, that you can do whatever you want here, that we're just hanging out? Maybe, I mean, it's not so much like, I'm not like sending out smoke signals, but, but it's, it's, it's it, it, I think in part for me, it's good practice um, because the, like I said, I, I, I wanna capture life as it happens. And if I see a shot that's important, and I know that it's not going to interrupt the moment, then I'll stand up and I'll go and I'll get my camera and I'll take the picture. But, but more than that, like a lot of these people, they keep me around because I'm their friend and because they know I can take a good picture, you know what I mean? But, but, but interrupting and because e even like, like, like these, the, these backstage moments, like these people, they're, they're preparing to go on stage in front of thousands of people and entertain them. And, and as I said before, like, like, as I, I liken them to thoroughbred racehorses, you don't, you don't want to like spook 
a, like a racehorse before that goes before the big race, you know what I mean? And so because um, kind of allowing them to maintain homeostasis and, and recognize that I am in a place of, of privilege. I, uh, I, it's important to me to. Yeah. Keep. Well, so I'm really interested in this dynamic because it, it, it kind of reminds me of war photographers who might go and embed in a platoon, you know, for a month. And in the first days when they're trying to earn the trust of, of the troops, um, they might see something and it might be something quite arresting um, that could make a great picture, but they decide not to take it because they don't want to spook. They don't want to make the, the soldiers uncomfortable. Um, so can you tell me, Marcus, sort of, you know, with that, with that in mind, um, what have you decided not to shoot? And how do you feel about letting that kind of a moment pass? Yeah, it's, well, I mean, I've, I, I have pretty good instincts, but I have failed <laughs> before, you know what I mean? And I've, and I've learned from those mistakes and, and thankfully enough, like it didn't ruin uh, opportunities to like, to be invited back, but that, that's a big part of it. Was that anything you want to share with us right now? Um, like one of the first times I hung up, hung out, or I was able to, to be in the same room with, with Dave, I, I went to take a picture without, you know, like really thinking about where I was and that like I was, at this point, I was hanging out with him and some of his closest friends, and, and you know, he didn't know me. Um, and yeah, like that, uh, I, <laughs> I, I mean, I've realized how uncomfortable I made the, the, the moment, you know? Okay. Um, so you just sort of caught a vibe. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, but like, I mean, I, 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 this is, a, a camera can be a, a pretty invasive thing, um, especially for people that aren't used to having them around or, or when they're like in a vulnerable moment. Um, so, so it's, but, but like, as you said, like, sort of like, but like seeing these moments, a lot of times I do see these moments like, gosh, I wish I could take that picture, but it's, it's almost like, if you want to call it like a form of meditation or stoicism, like to like, to see a, like this, allow the moment to pass and without necessarily like needing to, to dig my fingers into it and just accept what's happening and then let it move on and know that, you know, there's going to be other opportunities. Like, like the picture itself is not the most important thing. You know what? I think that is actually a really great thing um, for any photographer listening to this to, to sort of step back and think about it for a moment, because I think all of us, uh, including photo editors, think about this, this moment is important. We must get this moment. We must get this moment. And to hear you say, you know, almost like in a Buddhist way, don't cling to the moment. You know, you can, you can let it go in the service of furthering the relationship. Um, and I think that's an important thing to, um, to hold on to, but does it hurt to see, you know, a <laughs> beautiful, know, you know what I mean? Like, uh, <laughs> absolutely. There's a little bit of, there's a sting in there, but, uh, you know, like I, I, I fight the, the feeling of like worrying that someday I'll become irrelevant and, just I kind of have to, to lean into the fact that or believe that there'll be other opportunities and better opportunities, you know, especially if I'm patient and I wait. That's great. Um, so you worked on the set of um, The King of Staten Island with, with Pete Davidson and with the comic genius uh, Judd, Judd Apatow, um, who has brought us so many hysterical movies and films over the years. Um, shall we see what Judd has to say about you, Marcus? I would love to hear what Judd has to say. <laughs> All right, let's do it. Hi, this is Judd Apatow. I'm not as good at taking pictures and videos as Marcus Russell Price. I don't know how to make myself look good. And sometimes when he works on one of my movies or something, he takes pictures and they look good. And then... I tell people I took them. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, so we've just seen what, what Judd looks like possibly late at night, you know, squeezing something in for us, um, which I appreciate. Thank you so much. Um, but I want to talk to you about how you make Judd look so good. So when you're hanging out at a, you know, at dinner or a, or a shoe store with a comedian or, you know, when somebody's getting a tattoo or a liquor store or a liquor store, 
Um, what what sort of gear do you use and why do you use it? Um, when we're on the go, like if we're, you know, if we're moving through the streets or jumping in and out of cars or like, as you said, like at dinner, usually the, the camera I'll bring is, is one of my M cameras with my, my M10 or my M6 here. Um, that's a, it's, I love this camera so much. Um, and I'll, I, I, through the advice of Trayvon Free, who's a comedian, actor, director, he told me to get this, the, this Visoflex for it. Um, it just kind of allows me to get like different angles. And I, I, I love the setup so much um, because it, it, it's, as we said, as I was saying before, like I, I don't want to be intrusive or I don't want to interrupt and I don't want like the, the attention to be on me. And um, so for those moments that were those moments of access, I, I love the the M10 just because it's it's very unassuming and it's, it, it doesn't, uh, it, while it's a beautiful camera and, it, and it's perfect in so many ways, it, uh, it, it doesn't uh, interrupt the moment, and it's it's also it be, being that it's fully manual. I have to I have to fight with it a little bit. I'm not as quick with as I as I would be with like the SL2. Um, so as a result, like once again, I have to really kind of consider the shots that are most important rather than like very easily just pulling a camera up to my face anytime I have the inclination. I mean, I do want to say that um, it was Trayvon Free actually who I referenced in the, at the top of the hour, because he was, he's our mutual friend who introduced us. So, so thank you. Thank you, Trayvon. Trayvon. Um, what, what else do you have back there that we should maybe talk for a moment about and, and tell us how it helps you get the pictures you want to get. Yeah. Um, I have the SL2 here, which is just such, I can't say enough good things about this camera. It is, so awesome and i and i was able to get this one while uh last summer while i was shooting a lot of the um the protests after the the murder of george floyd and and this camera it I feel like it, it almost protected me in a certain type of way like it, it like ha having this camera and and building a relationship with Leica at the same time it um it felt really good to to be I don't know, to be working with a camera that I know that like, represented a company that had my back. And um, this camera is so fast, it's so fast. And the images, like the autofocus is, is laser sharp. And so using this camera, so I use it a lot during the, the performances as well. So for when I'm, those moments when the comics are on stage, I use the SL2 most frequently. Um, it's great in, in sort of like those dark rooms and like low light situations and it's so fast and I, I never really have to worry about missing a shot when I have the SL2 in my hand. And and, and what is that just over your right shoulder right there? Notice this one, huh? <laughs> this is my Lysina. You ever seen one of these? I this, have not. This is a Super 8 camera that was produced by uh, lights in the um, in the mid seventies. I think they made it from like seventy two to seventy seven. And this is a movie camera. This is a Super Eight movie camera. It has a power zoom and auto iris on it. It's a, a pretty incredible camera. Go ahead. I don't know if I have the batteries. You see that? Yes. Power zoom, auto iris. Can you believe it? I love this camera. It's so I, I, this is one of my most frequent recent acquisitions. Um, this is a cool. Very game. cool. I, so, I have big plans for this one. Um, so, Marcus, I just have to mention that you know, as as when we're talking about gear specifically, that um, one of the first times you and I talked, I asked you what you were shooting with then. And and this is and and you said this and I'm going to quote be, I'm going to quote you exactly because I actually took notes as you were talking. Mm. So you said, when I'm on the streets, I'm almost always carrying my M10 or my M6 because I'm a goddamn samurai and that's my sword. You know what I mean? I can't be caught without it. Is there anything you want to add to that, or does that sort of say it all? Yeah, I mean, like it's <laughs> having you. I, I think I sounded a little bit cooler when I said it, but <laughs> oh, there's no question. There's no question. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, it's that's the truth. You know what I mean? It's like it's. I don't know. Yeah, I am a samurai with this thing. You know, you you wouldn't see a samurai without a sword. And like a, a few years back, I, I realized, or rather, I made like a promise to myself, and that is, if I'm going to take myself seriously as an artist, then I need to take seriously the things that inspire me, because. Um, uh, and that includes like 
hanging out with people that inspire you, taking time for yourself, whether you're like you, when you and I went to the museum with, uh, with Trayvon to, to look at that exhibit, like that qualifies for that. Certainly. Cause I could, I, any of us could come up with a hundred reasons why like, Oh, we're too busy. Or I got to do this thing. Or I got to do that thing. But the taking time for inspiration is so important. And, and even if that, and then a lot of times for me, that includes investing in equipment. Like, like, I don't know how often, this is going to be like this is never going to be the most important <laughs> piece of gear that i have but it having it ex and the ability to use it excites me you know what i mean and so and that and that goes with inspiration like having this in my hand like oh like what can i do with this like where can i go like what kind of ideas and that that that's uh, fully qualifies as, as investing in, in oneself i think that's great. Well, so, so, you know, a couple of questions have come in, um, in the chat and, and I want to, and I think we're at a good time to ask you this too. You know, most of your work, as we've discussed, um, involves so much access, you know, incredible access. Um, but I want to share a few of your photos where that was not the case, where, where the things were shot without access. Cause I want, I want people to see, you know, your, your range as a photographer and as a, as a thinker. Um, so Vox sent you to Chowchilla, California, mm. which is a, which is a small town where in case people don't know in 1976, um, a busload full of school children was kidnapped, and the whole, the entire bus was buried. Um, and 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 don't worry, all the kids uh, escaped, and no one was hurt. But that incident left a deep and lasting scar on the town. And and Vox asked you to go and shoot this. And so I'm curious as if you could tell us what it was like for you to go and shoot there, um, and what were you looking for. Um, it's interesting, like, especially thinking of it by comparison with the sort of access that you said that I normally get. With that one, I had nothing prearranged. I went to this, this town that is very small, and anyone who's not from there, like, it's, it's pretty obvious. And so kind of going into this town, like myself, it made me feel really uncomfortable because I, I felt like I was in, almost invasive in a, a certain type of way. But, but that also directly goes against like sort of my my ethos of being a photographer so like first thing I wanted to do was just was just meet some people and so I went out without my camera and I I had my skateboard and I went to like a skate park they had there and I met some some skaters and I hung out with them for a while and I asked them questions and I had them start to show me around and I just kind of was just moving through this town I was there for for two days with a good friend of mine and us being there together, um, I think also really helped. Like I didn't feel quite feel so alone, but um, it was it was a. I'd like to shoot more on assignment because that that was a really, uh, I really stand, that that assignment really stands out to me. And um, the images I was able to get while I was there, I, they're some of my favorite I've ever ever taken. I think just well, they, well this 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 picture that we're looking at right here of the oranges that have fallen on the ground. Um, uh, I find that really haunting. I love that picture. Yeah, I like that one too. The, as you said, I mean, for the people, it, it's, it's it's not a story that a lot of people know. But as you said, these these children were kidnapped. Basically, these these three kids from they they were in their twenties from Northern California had an idea like a, a get rich or rather get richer quick scheme, and they had this plan to kidnap these children and and ransom them back to the the town. And so like these kids and this, and it, back then it was even smaller than when I was there. Um, everyone in that town knew someone that was on that bus. Um, and it, it's like the, there was suddenly a hole in this community and kind of like this photo here, I think you and I discussed it before on the phone, it kind of helps really illustrate that something's missing here. Here, here is this fruit that's, you know, going unnoticed or uneaten in this yeah. case. And these are some of the images I was capturing while I was there is I was looking for, you know, like, sign frames that was missing the sign or missing fence posts or just um a lot yeah i i i think they're really smart pictures um i want to move to the pictures that we just hit on you hit on a moment ago um you know that you made in the wake of george floyd's murder uh and then the protests the massive protests that um that we saw in the summer of 2020 um and you know i love your take on this and and i especially love uh one of the pictures in this series of a woman wearing a, a full a full mask mm -hmm. um 
And again, this feels like the opposite of the conditions that you are used to shooting in, you know, with access and some amount of control. Um, can you tell us what it was like for you to shoot in this, in this environment? Um, it was tough. It was, it was chaotic. I mean, there's a lot of different things. I, I don't want to just call it just one thing in particular. I mean, a lot of times it, it was, uh, it was exciting. You know what I mean? It was, it was nice to be in the streets that with people that were feeling similar to how I was feeling, but other times it, it did feel very dangerous and chaotic and unpredictable. And, and when people are, excited and people are emotional and people are worked up they become very unpredictable i think humans are the scariest animal that exists on this planet you know what i mean and so That's the picture i was talking about yeah 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 and so like i don't know i was i was moving fast and i was always looking around me and and this particular this this image um i, I don't know it was particularly i i had i was using my m10 and i was um had it set to like a certain like just just range and it was just the right moment at the exact right time she wasn't even looking at me but for that very moment she looked back and i snapped the photo and, and well you uh, yeah you nailed it um when i first saw these pictures and asked you about them you said something that i love and again you know you're someone who captures moments with your camera i capture them with my notes so i was taking notes when you were talking and this is what you said you said you told me, I was trying to capture the emotions as I was feeling them myself. There were times when I felt joyous, like we're out here, we're doing this, and times when I was angry. I'd see people that were mirroring my emotions, and I wanted to capture that. So my question is, were you consciously looking for an external representation of what you were feeling in a given instant? And is that a technique that you use often? Well, it, it definitely helped me. You know, because it's like I, I, I was certainly I was there documenting it, but I was also there because I, I believed in it, you know. And so like I, I being filled with so many emotions, I, I was seeing people that were sort of mirroring how I was feeling in particular moments. And so to be able to capture that was was cathartic for me in a, in a certain type of way. Like somehow, somehow like the, the world hurts less when I can fit a piece of it through like a camera lens, you know, and it's, it's a magical thing. It doesn't necessarily change reality. But it is able to draw beauty out of it. You know, it takes some of the hard edges and can smooth them out. It can turn a, a crowd of people into a, a group of individuals. Um, of course, there are exceptions to this, but well, well said. Well, before we turn to um, audience questions, which I'm really eager to um, to get to, um, let's look at one last video from just an amazing stand-up comedian and Daily Show senior correspondent Rodney Chang. How did I meet Marcus Russell Price? Well, I was doing stand-up gigs in New York City, and after one gig at the Comedy Cellar, uh, Marcus comes up to me, and he introduces himself. I heard of the name, the famous Marcus Russell Price, photographer to the stars, and he says, he asked me if he can, he can follow me home and take photos along the way. And I'm like, oh yeah, sure thing, let, let, let's do it. And so we walk home from the comedy cellar and he kind of like directs me to this one spot in New York City that he says, I think we can get a cool photo in this spot if you're willing to take a detour. So I'm like, okay, let's, let, let's go see what this is about. And we get to this spot that has some neon lights and he just takes like maybe five photos and the photos end up becoming the tour poster photos. I'm talking stuff he just pulled out of his ass became my go-to marketing photos for, for my entire national stand-up tour. Um, and so that's how good he is. He's so good that he, the photos he pulls out of his ass are better than, you know, the planned stuff we try to force um, you know, with anyone else. So thanks, Marcus. You're the best. And that, and that right there is the photo that you pulled from somewhere, correct? Yeah, that, that was the day I met Ronnie. It, it's it, <laughs> I didn't follow him to his house. <laughs> he invited well, whatever, me to dinner. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but we went, we went out and we got some food. And as he was leaving, I was like, "Can we take a picture?" So we we I took him to in Manhattan, this place, Amsterdam Billi Amsterdam Billiards, and that was the payphone right in front of it. Well, that's great. It looks fantastic. So it looks like we have some uh, questions from the audience coming in. So. 
Well, are you ready to field, uh, field a few of those, Marcus? Yes, give it a shot. Great. Um, here's a great one. What do you learn by observing and photographing your favorite comedians off stage? Um, what do I learn? Gosh. Um, I, I learned something different from, from all of them. Like they're, they're, they're all obviously wildly talented, but they're also wildly different. Um, you know, Hannibal is, is a, a very creative and, and shrewd businessman. He's always thinking of new ideas and, and new ways to change things. It's not even just business wise, but just, he's always trying new things, always trying new things. And, and they, they, maybe they don't all work, but the fact that he's always willing to try and, and extend himself in that way. I love that about Hannibal. Um, with Pete, like fam uh, his friends and family are the most important thing to him. You know what I mean? And I love how much he loves his friends and how much he, he they're the most important thing to him, the way he wants to take care of them and, and include them in his life. Uh, I love that about him. Like with, with Amy, like she's, she's, um, she's very, she has a very public persona and she's, like I said, she'll be on stage in front of tens of thousands of people, but also she reserves so much of herself just for her family. And um, she takes time for herself. Like she, she deals with things immediately so that she's then able to have that time for herself and for her family. And she's, she's very protective of that. And so I, I could, I can name something this bad, but all the comics I work from, but, but I certainly, by watching them, I, I am able to take so much away from myself. Maybe that doesn't necessarily relate to photography so much, but it, it helps make me a better person. Um, that's great. So the, um, uh, the next question is, when you're digging for the essence of a person's soul, the soft spot under its shell, are there moments that are too intimate to show to the public? Do you feel you ever come too close? Mm. I mean, I certainly have access to, to those really intimate moments. Um, and I, actually that's my retirement plan. I have a lot of these images that, <laughs> I'll be able to eventually blackmail all these. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it goes back to what I was saying before. Is it, just is is just knowing what's appropriate and knowing that that I don't have to be here. It could very easily be someone else, but a, 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 a large level of trust is given to me. Um, and so I, I have oftentimes I'll share images. That I've taken of Amy and her family and her son, and I'll, I'll give them direct to her, and I won't. No one else will ever see those photos because they're not for anyone else; they're for her. You know what I mean? And then that's as a photographer that works with these people. That's my largest goal. Is I want to give all of them something that they can look back on 10, 20 years from now and, and realize, like, not just, not not even realize anything, but just just to have these moments that they're able to turn back to and, and remember. And fantastic. Um... Here's, here's a, a more technical question um, and um, a little bit less about digging under the soul. Um, can you share a bit about how you process your photographs, particularly the color images? Most have a stronger film look than the out of the camera JPEGs from uh, an SL2 or an M10. Yeah, that I mean, I started shooting on film cameras. My first camera I ever had was, was film and I, and I went and I started shooting my friends bands playing and so like I think that that's it goes back I, I play music too and like the like the sound I search for when I'm when I'm playing bass is like is really the first sound I ever came up with and that was like this really big boomy <laughs> warm analog sound and I think the images I take now can might kind of mirror that in a sense that like those are the images that feel the most real and and I, I don't always have the privilege to shoot on 35 millimeter film um but I, what I love about film is that it's, it, it is an actual physical representation of a moment in time because it, those are light beams, like ions, like hitting a, a film surface and leaving an impression upon them. And then you're able to make a print from that. It is an actual physical representation of a moment in time. And that's the look and feel that I love the most. So when I'm editing my photos in, in Lightroom, a lot of times that is, I guess, sort of what I um, lean towards or would default to. Yeah, what I love is that, you know, there is this thing that none of us can see called trust. Uh, we feel it, but we can't see it. But somehow in your photos, I at least am able to see that in the image, which I think is pretty remarkable and really cool. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a couple of questions that, that kind of 
touch on what we've gone to before, but they all they all sort of run around this question, which is, you know, when you're trying to stay friends with your subjects and you know maybe keep your clients happy, you know, like a Netflix or 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 a Comedy Central, and also produce images that we the viewers uh, are engaged with and and love. Which of those three compartments um, sort of takes precedence? Uh, I'm sorry, say, say it once more, Bill. So, so you're sort of shooting for three different con, con, uh, constituencies. Uh, you know, the, the performers themselves, in yeah. some cases, the, the client, be it Netflix or, or mm -hmm. Comedy Central, but also you want to make a picture that the viewer yeah. really locks into and feels something. So does one take precedence over the other? Um, I mean, I don't <laughs> want to say it's always up to me. I'd, I'd love it to always be up to me, but sometimes you have to satisfy the client and that's, that's something that, that has to take into consideration. But, but yeah, I mean, but at the same time, like if you trust the, the product, you have to trust the machine. And, and that's kind of something that more and more that it, like, as I become someone that, that is like the first phone call that people trust me to, to they trust my instincts and what I think is good. And I think uh, I'm um, thankful for that. So, so somebody asked, what's, what's next for you? Um, you know, as you follow your heart, what's, um, what's in the future for you, Marcus Russell Price? Um, taking more photos, you know, I, I've been directing a little bit lately, which has been really cool. Uh, been using our lenses, which has been fun. Um, but uh, yeah, I want to, this comedy, I love being in comedy and certainly that's, I don't exclusively work within it, but it, it definitely has captured my heart. I'm a, I think laughter is so important. And I think that like, I'm a, in some instances, like a, like a deeply broken person and laughter is something that uh, really is like effectively allows me to lick my wounds. Um, and so I, I'd love to remain or, or continue to exist within the comedy space, but also I, I wouldn't mind more assignments. Like go, like, like as when I went to, to Chow Chilla, I'm yeah. really looking forward to, to directing more. I've got a couple more comedy specials that I'm going to be directing this year. Fantastic. Um, but also I don't want to limit myself. I, I want to be open to, to whatever opportunities present themselves. Um, last question. Um, someone asks, in your opinion, other than good judgment, which you've talked about, um, what are what are sort of some other skills that amplify uh, a great photographer like yourself and and make them even better? Mm. What, say it one more time. Um, other than good judgment, which we've yeah. talked about, what are what are a couple other human skills that amplify a great photographer like you and helps make them even better? I mean, I, I think experience, it's, it's, people ask me a lot, like, how do I do what you do? Or how do I break into it? I, I think you, like volunteering yourself is the most important thing. That's, that's how I met Hannibal's. I volunteered myself, you know what I mean? It's putting yourself out there and searching for more experience. Um, uh, John Locke said that the, the mind is furnished by ideas or with ideas by experience alone, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and so constantly putting yourself out there, meeting new people, volunteering yourself for things. Um, and, and don't be a fucking weirdo. <laughs> There's too many weirdos that's, already. That's great. I, I love ending a program with a John Locke quote. I try to do it every single time. Um, so thank you. Um, so we have come to the end of the program. Uh, a big thanks to everyone out there from for attending wherever you are. Um, Marcus, yeah, thanks, a huge thanks to you. Huge thanks to Photoville. And of course... Thank you, Leica, so much. Um, yeah. Can I say that? Um, Can I say thanks to Leica and thanks to everyone? for First of all, everyone who watched this, thanks so much. It means so much to me. I, it, it's always very strange when people care about what I'm up to. So it, it, it means a lot to me. And um, thank you, Bill. Uh, damn it. I love you so much. And, and, and thank you, Leica, for, for caring about me and for having my back. And, and it's, it's really, really uh, a pleasure and really... A, unusual to have a camera company care as much as like like it does and it's, it's not lost on me at all so thank you that's, all that's beautiful that's great so um you can reach um uh, marcus and you can reach me on on instagram um at at marcus russell price 
and at Bill Shapiro. And you'll also see on the screen, there's ways to get in touch with Leica as well. Uh, so thanks again, everybody, really for all your questions and all your attention. Uh, have a great weekend and be safe out there. Thanks everyone.